Our scripture reading this morning is taken from 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 13 and reading through verse 22. It is found on page uh, 1,475 in the Pew Bibles if you'd like to follow along there. Who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you should suffer for doing what is right, how happy you are. Do not be afraid of anyone and do not worry, but have reverence for Christ in your hearts and honor him as Lord. Be ready at all times to answer anyone who asks you to explain the hope that you have in you. But do it with gentleness and respect. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are insulted, those who speak evil of your good conduct as followers of Christ will become ashamed of what they say. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if this should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ died for sins once and for all, a good man on behalf of sinners in order to lead you to God. He was put to death physically, but made alive spiritually. And in his spiritual existence, he went and preached to the imprisoned spirits. These were the spirits of those who had not obeyed God when he waited patiently during the days that Noah was building his boat. The few people in the boat, eight in all, were saved by the water, which was a symbol pointing to baptism, which now saves you. It is not the washing off of bodily dirt, but the promise made to God from a good conscience. It saves you through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone to heaven and is at the right side of God, ruling over all angels and heavenly authorities and powers. May God bless the reading of his word. Suffering. It's as timeless as the history of humanity since the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. It's also a fact that throughout history, from that moment on, humanity has tried to understand and to come to terms with suffering. In Job, the story of suffering begins with the idea presented by Job's friends that if anyone has is suffering, they've obviously done something wrong. And therefore, as Job's friends tell him, confess and be done with it. What have you done? Confess it and move on. And Job continually is professing his innocence. You see, the story of Job runs contrary to that idea. Once again, this past week, we have seen undeserved suffering take place. And sadly, what we saw in Florida is probably only one of a multitude of events worldwide, but it's the one that we know of and that we are aware of. And so the question again is, how do we react to suffering? What do we do? What do we say? Do we do anything? Do we, re, do we react as Job's friends who say obviously someone has done something wrong and therefore they are suffering and uh, confess your sins and, and, and go on and let God deal with it? Or others would strike out and lash out uh, at whomever they could, including anyone who would try to help in that moment of suffering. The thing is, is that we all try to understand, we all try to cope with suffering itself. Now one of the things, and perhaps it's a trait of, of Western Christianity, because we live in a time and a place where the struggles and, and the heartache and the pain are not quite what they are in other parts of the world. And so for some reason it seems that many Christians want to present Christianity 
as a story without suffering, almost as a utopia. If you accept Christ, nothing good will happen to you. It runs counter to what we see, what we know, what we read in the pages of the New Testament. And so we look at 1 Peter today, and it gives us some understanding of the Christian response to suffering. Now, in this experience, Peter is writing to Christians in Asia Minor, because when you read the beginning of the letter, it's those churches that, that are in that area, which is now Turkey, but it covers several of the, the provinces of the Roman Empire that, that are in that area. So it's a, it's a general letter, not to just a group of Christians in one particular location, but in the entire area. And, it, and as it deals with many issues about how you live out your faith, we also then deal with this issue of suffering. And for them, scholars tell us that probably a lot of what they were facing, because many of them would have come from, from uh, well, whatever strata of society they came from, they would be slandered because of their faith in Christ. This idea of believing in this one that you call Jesus, this, this Messiah. <coughs> and so we're told that probably at least part of what it was was not persecution they're dealing with, but the slander and, and then the, the ostrac being ostracized in, in their society. How do you react? How do you react when someone slanders you? Because to slander or to ostracize you is a form of suffering. You're no longer a part of the, of the overall general community. We begin to see and understand that what Peter is saying, we have suffering that goes on in this world, and then there is the addition of what can be experienced in, in life by being a Christian. Now, again, going back to the idea that we seem to present Christianity as something without suffering, we're trying to present something that would become appealing to many different people. And yet when we do that, what happens is when there are people who are suffering, whether they are in the church or outside of the church, they look at that and go, that doesn't mesh with the reality that I am experiencing. One of the things that when you look at the history of the church in America is that it seems that some way we have created this disconnect in what we say and what we do, that may be one of the reasons that uh, from the 1950s, in the 1950s, they tell us, sociologists and all say that that was the time when attendance in church was at its highest level. And whether anybody really understood everything about Christianity, there was something of the general tone of, of life that, that that filtered over into the rest of society as they experienced this. But what happened, it seems, is that while we said one thing, we did not model what Peter is saying here. You see, when a Christian is dealing with suffering, when a Christian is dealing with life, we are to be looking to Christ and we are to be modeling Christ. And so what we are dealing with then is a new way of life, a different way of dealing with the things that happen. We are reordering our priorities. And Peter tells us to look to Jesus and to honor him in everything. And again, in order to do that, you have to model yourself after Christ. And so as Peter tells us, and as we remember, Jesus is one who suffered. He suffered at his trial, and yet he did not lash out at those who accused him. 
those who abused him. He did not respond in kind to them. Even more than that, he went to the cross and he suffered the disgrace of that death. And in doing that, he took upon us, he took upon himself our sin. And again, we ask, what is sin? Well, we talk about it as being missing the mark. We talk about it as being rebellion against God. This week, I, I was listening to a talk that uh, Timothy Keller had, had given, and the talk was entitled, Boasting in Nothing Except the Cross. And he gave this definition of sin. He said, sin is your life to serve me. To say that another way, it is to say that I am going to make you sacrifice in order to serve me. Everything I do is all about my desire, what I want. And as a result of that, then everything else is put into that perspective. And so if we are thinking from a sin perspective, when someone slanders us, when someone makes us suffer, our response then is to want to make them pay, to respond somehow or other in kind. And yet Jesus did not make them, did not make us pay for our sin. Instead, he took upon himself our guilt. And this was love. He did this because of love. And again, to, to refer to that same lecture, as Timothy Keller says, that is real love. Real love is substitutionary. It's love that says, my life for yours. In that, there is hope of renewal. There is hope of something different. There's hope of change. And, and Peter tells us of that love that, that is to be ours in Christ, that this is to become our identity. And so with that identity, we're not limited to a narrow view of the world that is, is just experiencing suffering in this moment, and that's all it is. We can see nothing beyond that. He says we, we experience that moment, but we don't respond in, in, we don't respond by lashing out. As a boy, I remember being at my grandparents at the farm and, uh, who knows how this happened? There was a, a woven wire fence that uh, was on the property and it was next to the road. Apparently someone had, had dumped a dog out and that dog had tried to go across the fence and had gotten caught. And, and when my father went down there to release the dog, he's like, just stand back. I was this kid that was just gonna run up there and my dad said, wait. And he took a jacket and he put it over the dog's head because, because this dog is in pain and suffering. And he knows that it might lash out. And so he has me do something in order to wait. And then when we were able to get the dog loose, it had one leg caught and nothing was wrong. And, and so that dog became... Uh, one of my brother and I's best pets ever, loyal as she could be, loving as she could be. But he knew in that moment of suffering that she might lash out. And this is what, what Peter is telling us, that sometimes we want to lash out, we want to react in the same way of the world because what we are dealing with is this mindset that says, I'm going to make you sacrifice to serve me. I'm going to lash out because of what I am experiencing when in reality, he say, Peter is telling us, we in Christ are to take upon ourselves the identity 
that is Christ himself. In Christ, we are renewed and we are changed so that when others slander us, when, when we experience suffering, our reaction to it is different. It is a kind word. It is, it is an example. It is a modeling of Christ so that others see something else and can experience something else. It's through Jesus that we overcome. And then we see as if you need to be encouraged in this, Peter talks about Jesus going and preaching to the spirits that are in prison. I know that, that I have always thought of that as when you read that as those persons, and, and you may too, those persons that... Uh, that were living before the flood, and so at the flood, they, uh, they died, and, they had, and now Jesus is preaching to them. But I, I came across another example of this, of what it might be. And again, that's one example. And the other is, is that, that Jesus is, the, those spirits that are in prison are those spirits that when you read the first part of Genesis, uh, and the first part of, of Genesis chapter 6, they are the spirits that are leading humanity, leading men and women astray. And so that at the flood, they have now been imprisoned and being held so that they cannot do that once again to humanity. Well, what we don't want to get caught up in, but that's a, that's a very interesting thought, but we don't want to get caught up in the who Jesus was preaching to, but instead we need to consider the what that is being represented here. Consider this. Before the flood, evil was in process of destroying humanity. When Jesus was upon the earth, evil sought to destroy him, sought to minimize the, the impact of his testimony, of what he was to be about. We have talked about in Mark how the demons, those people who were demon-possessed, how the demons recognized Jesus and knew who he was. Their goal was always to minimize or to destroy the ministry, the witness of Jesus, and ultimately to destroy him. And yet here is Jesus, Peter says, being raised from the dead and being glorified by God, and he is preaching to these spirits. And what he is preaching to them is the power of the victory that God has given him the power of the resurrection, the power of life, and the renewing that is his. And by that, then, to you and I as part of the body of Christ, it is his resurrection that we participate in. Evil might seek to thwart the plan of God, and yet here is Jesus overcoming that, and he now sits in heaven with God. And this is who we belong to as Christians. Through baptism, we have been made new in Christ. And so we know that the troubles of the world are temporary. We know what the Lord himself has experienced he has experienced the worst of suffering and he has overcome. And therefore, in Christ, we too are to overcome. There's a story told about a man that fell in a deep hole and he cried out for help. And at one point, a doctor walked by and upon hearing the man in this hole, the doctor looked down and saw him and he wrote out a prescription for him and took it, dropped it in the hole to the man. 
Didn't help much, did it? But a little later, along came a minister, and as he walked by, he heard the cry of the man in the hole, and he stopped, and he looked, and so he wrote out a prayer, and he dropped it in the hole, and, and then he went on also. And the man continued to cry out, and it wasn't long before a friend, his best friend, came by and heard him crying in the hole. And, and this best friend jumped in the hole with the man. And he's like, how stupid could you be? Now we're both down here in this hole. And his friend said, <coughs> I know, but I've been here before and I know the way out. To present Christ as Lord comes from knowing him as Lord. And to know him as Lord is to know the way out. Let us pray. Father, you are our God, and you have sent your Son, Jesus Christ, as Lord to become the atonement for us, the way out of sin, to be the renewal for us, so that even in the midst of, of pain and suffering, in you we know the way out. May your strength be our strength. May your renewal be ours, both now and forever. Amen.